Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the auditory system. Okay, so, we're in the process of discussing the labyrinth, also known as the inner ear, and at the moment we've discussed the bony labyrinth. Now what I'd just like to do is draw the bony labyrinth out for you again, another bigger picture, just to make sure that this concept is clear in your head, because it is a complicated structure anatomically. Uh, and then what I want to do is discuss um, the structure of the bony cochlea in more detail, and then we'll start to have a look at what's inside um, these bony structures. Okay, so, we'll start off with the cochlea first then. So here it is. This is the innermost spiral, if you like. And then it continues on round, and it goes round two and a half times. Remember, so far we've gone round one, there's our second time, and then it will come off down here. So there's two and a half times we've gone round now. And it will come up like so, and then this is where the bony cochlea is ending, and we're now going into the vestibule up here, so I'll put a little dash line there. Uh, so we're now in the vestibule, and what I want to show you again is the semicircular canals which are coming off the vestibule. So I'm going to start with the lateral semicircular canal. So here's the ampulla of the lateral semicircular canal. And it's in this sort of plane that's in between a sagittal plane and a transverse plane. It's sort of like that. It's in that sort of a plane, if you like. And I'll remind you that this picture that I'm drawing here is looking at the bony labyrinth from an anterior view. So there is our uh, lateral semicircular canal. Then what we'll have is the anterior semicircular canal coming off like so. Okay. And that's in a sort of sagittal plane. And remember, the anterior and posterior semicircular canals, they share this joining point at the back. Okay, so they're continuous with one another at the back, and they'll be joining onto the vestibule, like so. And then the posterior semicircular canal will be coming like this in a sort of coronal plane, and again, it will be attaching back onto the vestibule. So just sort of join the lines up now. There we go. We have these three semicircular canals, and I'll colour them in again. So this one here, in in red, this is the anterior semicircular canal, okay, then in blue here, and there should be an ampulla there as well, this is the posterior semicircular canal, and then finally, in orange here, this is the lateral semicircular canal, and then they're all coming off the vestibule. So the lateral semicircular canal, it's always in front of the posterior semicircular canal. So this ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal, it will be behind the lateral uh, semicircular canal. Okay, so there's the picture that we've seen so far. What I now want to do is discuss the structure of the bony cochlea in more detail, because the bony cochlea consists of two different portions, a portion known as the modulus, and a portion known as the spiral canal. And the spinal canal is the portion that we're seeing here, and the modulus is the portion that the spiral canal is uh, wrapped around. And I apologise if I've said the spinal canal, the spiral canal. So there are these two parts to the bony cochlea. One is known as the modulus, and the other is called the spiral canal. And of course, were they interested in the cochlea? Because that's the part with the auditory transduction uh, apparatus inside it. So we want to study this in more detail. So to see this, what I want to do is take a, a cross-section through the bony cochlea. I want to take a cross-section like this through the bony cochlea. And I now want to look at it from above. So we cut this bony cochlea in the transverse plane, as shown in my picture here. We take off the top, if you like, and we're now going to expose the bottom and see what we can see. Okay, so right down the centre, what you have is this structure, which is in a sort of cone shape, like so, which is made of bone, and it's known as the modulus. So this is the modulus, and we've cut right the way through it. So it would be right at the centre here. So if I paste my drill here, I'd be going through the modulus very soon. Or in fact, I would be going through the modulus if I put it right at the centre here. And it's the thing which the spiral canals are wrapped around to give this seashell appearance. Okay, so this is the modulus, and this is 
again sitting in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So to orient you, this is anterior here, this is posterior, this is lateral, this is medial. So now let's continue on with the picture. So let's start off with this portion that we've cut through here. I want to put the spiral canals on this picture now. So I can see that I've cut through here, and that will be a spiral canal like this around the modulus. I'm going to colour code this in to make sure that the message gets across. So remember, this is the medial side, this is medial of the tip. The tip of the modulus is this portion here. So I've now just gone medial to the modulus, and there we've got our first spiral canal in blue there. Then we wrap around to here, and we've also cut through there. So where is that spiral canal on the modulus? Well, that will be here. Okay, like so. So this has wrapped around the modulus to become this one. So if I was a little man, I could go into this tube here in blue, and I could go down this little canal here and get to this cross section here. And then you continue on. This would wrap over and then it will get to here, and then we've got our next portion of a spinal canal that we're seeing uh, here. So I'll colour this bit in in green. And this is all one great big tube here that's wrapped around the modulus. It's like a hose pipe wrapped around uh, this cone, okay? Uh, and it's known as the spinal, sorry, the spiral canal. I keep on wanting to say spinal canal, but spiral canal. Spinal canals, but something very different. Okay, and then you continue on round the spiral canal, and then you'll get to this bit, and that's the bit that we see here in orange, like so. And then you continue on, you'll go round to here, and that bit will be around the modulus over here. And we'll have that portion, which colours have I not used yet? Red I haven't used. So that will have this portion in red here. And then you continue on further, so you go round here, and then you'll come to the portion of the spiral canal, which we would see over here. And I'll have that in yellow. Okay, so I hope that has got the message across that this structure, this bony cochlea, it just consists of a tube that has an ending. So the tube does end. If you were a little man and you started here and you walked around the spiral canal, it will get to a dead end very shortly after this blue portion here. It's just a tube wrapped around a cone piece of bone known as the modulus, and that's what the bony cochlea actually consists of. Okay, and this tube is continuous over here with the vestibule. Excellent. So, one more thing I want to show you on this picture before we now actually look at what's inside this tube, the membranous portion of the cochlea, if you like. Um, what I want to show you is something known as the spiral ligament. So off the side of the modulus, you have a little sort of raised portion of bone, and this is kind of similar to um, that raised portion of metal that you have in a screw. So if you look at a screw, you can follow that raised piece of metal along the screw. There's a very similar thing, a, a piece of bone, that is around the modulus. So around the modulus, it goes like this. So starting over here, you have a raised little portion of bone, and this goes all the way around the modulus on the underside over to here, and here is it appearing in this cross section again, and it will go round the modulus further over to here, and we'll see it again in the cross section appearing here. Then it will go under the modulus, and again we'll see it in cross section appearing here. So I hope this is clear what I'm talking about here. There is a raised portion of bone that spirals around the modulus like this, like that raised portion of metal on a screw, and I'm afraid I don't know what the name for that raised portion of metal on a screw is, but this portion of bone is very similar to that, and it's known as the spiral ligament, and it continues on further. So, continuing on, it will go round the modulus here, all over the superior surface, and then again we'll see it in our cross section here, and then down under the bottom, and again we'll see it in the cross section here. So this um, raised portion of bone on the surface of the modulus, that's known as the spiral ligament, and we'll see that the spiral ligament is going to have one of the membranes that's inside the bony cochlea attached to it. Okay, right. So that's enough discussion of the bony cochlea then. Let's now actually talk about what's inside this spiral canal. Okay, so the spiral canal, the first thing to discuss is that it's split into 
three different compartments by two membranes. The first membrane that we will start off with is called the basilar membrane. So what I'm going to do, just for an example, let's take this portion of the spiral canal here. Although we could take any portion of the spiral canal, you could chop it anywhere, but I'm just going to take a random place. We'll go for this portion here, and I'm going to draw that out again. So this is the modulus in the centre here. Here is the bony spiral canal portion of bone surrounding it here. Here is the spiral ligament coming off the modulus like so. And now what I want to show you is how this compartment, which at the moment we just think is one great big hollow compartment here, is going to be split into three different compartments, not by bone now, but by softer membranes. Okay, so I'll colour these in with highlighters. So there is one membrane that goes from the spiral ligament to the outer portion of uh, the spiral canal here, the outer wall of the spiral canal. And this is known as the basilar membrane. So in red there, that is the basilar membrane. Right, so I hope you understand that we're not... Th this picture is of course just looking at a single section, but this will be going all the way around. So you follow the spiral canal all the way around, this basilar membrane will be there, stretching between the spiral ligament that goes all the way around and the outer wall of the spiral canal. So if I was a little man starting my journey here, I could walk on the basilar membrane all the way around here, all the way around, etc. So it makes up well, it divides the spiral canal into two compartments straight away, all the way around. But there's going to be another important membrane that I'm about to add on. So I'll do this next important membrane here in orange, like so. And this is where it becomes important that I uh, differentiate front from back. So this is the anterior aspect, so this is the part facing forward, and this is the posterior aspect, so this other membrane goes forward to the anterior aspect, rather than going back to the posterior aspect. Okay, so what is the name then of this membrane that I've coloured in there in orange? Well, this is known as Reisner's membrane. Okay, so we've got these two membranes that go all the way around the spiral canal, the basilar membrane and Reisner's membrane. Okay, and they split the spiral canal into three separate compartments. So again, just to emphasize this, if I was a little man beginning my journey here, and I was in this top compartment, then I could continue walking on the Reisner's membrane all the way around, and I'd remain in the top compartment. Okay, now there is one little break to this, which is when I get right to the apex. Okay, so this is the the right end of the spiral canal up here, this is known as the apex of the spiral canal. When you get right to the apex of the spiral canal, that's where Reisner's membrane and the basilar membrane, they end basically, and they will have a portion sealing them off. So what I mean by that is if I was to get here, Reisner's membrane and the basilar membrane would connect to one another to make sure that this middle compartment wasn't open. So if I was right in the apex here, what I would be able to do is I'd be able to go into the top compartment or the bottom compartment, but I wouldn't be able to go into the middle compartment. Okay, so right at the end then there is a communication between the top compartment and the bottom compartment, but there's no entry to the middle compartment, and that hole is known as the helico trema. Okay, so I'm trying to think of a way of drawing that to explain it better. I will just draw out this little bit right at the apex of the spiral canal here. So this is supposed to be a copy of this. So this is the apex of the spiral canal here. Okay, so all the way around you have got the basilar membrane connected to the spiral ligament um, towards the centre and then um, the outside of the spiral canal towards the edge, like so. Okay, and I'll just, so this is the spiral ligament here in black connecting up. Okay, except right at the apex, that's where the base of the membrane stops. And it's the same story for Reisner's membrane, it stops right here as well. 
but Risner's membrane and the basilar membrane, they'll seal together to close off the middle compartment, so that if I was a little man standing in this space here, right at the apex of the spiral canal, I would not be able to go into this middle compartment, because Risner's membrane and the basilar membrane have sealed together to close the middle compartment off. However, I would be able to go above the basilar membrane into the top compartment here, and I would be able to go below the um, basilar membrane into the bottom compartment. So I, there is a communication at the apex of the spiral canal between the top compartment and, well, the front compartment and the back compartment. I should say the front and back rather than top and bottom. In this picture it's top and bottom, but remember this picture is badly oriented. This is showing a side view, uh, a transverse section rather than a sagittal section or coronal section. So this is front, this is back. So if I was here, I would be able to go forwards into this compartment, or I would be able to go backwards into this compartment, but these, the free edges of these membranes are attached to one another to seal off this entrance into the middle compartment, so you wouldn't be able to go into the middle compartment. And this communication point between the top sorry, I've said done it again, front and back compartments, that is known as the helicotrema. Okay, right, so now it's time for me to give you the names of these important compartments, the front, back, and middle compartments. So we'll start with the front compartment. And by the way, I'd like to just add this onto this picture. So here is Reisner's membrane in red here. And here is, sorry, that's not Reisner's membrane, that's the base of the membrane in red. And then Reisner's membrane is here in orange like so, going forwards. So, the front compartment in all of these cases, so this compartment, this compartment, this compartment, this compartment, this compartment, and this compartment, this is known as the scala vestibuli. So that's the scala vestibuli compartment. The posterior compartment, this is known as the scala tympani compartment. Okay? And then finally, the middle compartment here, this has multiple different names. This is known as scala media, for middle compartment, um, but it's also called the cochlear duct. So you can hear it referred to as either scala media or the cochlear duct, and they refer to the exact same thing. Okay, right, so you've got the cochlear duct then going all the way round the spiral canal. What I now want to discuss is what happens to these three different compartments when we actually get up to the vestibule. Now, I know we're not doing the vestibular system, however, I still want you to have a clear picture of the anatomy in your mind. So what I want to do is actually talk about what happens up here. So we've talked about what happens over here. In the cochlea, I hope it's completely clear all of the cochlea, apart from right at the apex of the spiral canal, you have these three compartments, scala vestibuli, scala media, and scala tympani. Um, right at the apex, the scala media seals up by the rhizus membrane and the basilar membrane joining together, and then there's a communication between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, known as the helicotrema. What I now want to do is have a look at what happens up here. And this will help to explain why this compartment is actually known as the scala vestibuli. Right, uh, so what I need to do then in order to explain this further is to take a picture where I'm going to view the labyrinth now from the lateral side here. So I want to now stand lateral to the labyrinth and look medially at the labyrinth because this will illustrate a very important point, the point that the vestibule isn't quite as thick as the uh, the basal portion of the spiral canal here. So we've talked about how this portion of the spiral canal right at the end is known as the apex. The portion right down here, this is known as the basal portion of the spiral canal. So we have the basal portion all the way up to the apical portion of the spiral canal. Okay, so I'm going to take this picture from the medial side then and draw it here. So, here, this is the basal turn of the spiral canal, so this is the basal spiral canal. So I'll just enable this up, so this is the basal spiral canal. And then above the basal spiral canal, what we're going to have 
is then the vestibule attached on top, like so, and then you'll have the semicircular canals coming off up here. So this is the vestibule, and what you can see here is that the posterior portion of the spiral canal doesn't have a portion of the vestibule above it. And this is why the scala tympani actually comes to an end, because remember what's which compartment is it that's in the posterior portion of this basal spiral canal? So if I was to take a cross section through like this, this basal spiral canal would look exactly like this. Okay, the posterior portion, this bit back here, would be scala tympani, the middle portion would be scala media, and the uh, anterior portion would be scala vestibuli. What's going to happen is that the scala media, the cochlear duct, is going to be continuous and go into the vestibule, and also scala vestibuli is going to be continuous and go into the vestibule, but scala tympani is not going to be continuous and is not going to go into the vestibule. So drawing this on, demarcating the three different compartments here. So this is the basilar membrane here in red, and this is Reisner's membrane here in orange, and we've now got the three different compartments viewed from the lateral hand side. Here is scala tympani, here is the cochlear duct, and here is scala vestibuli. What happens is that the cochlear duct continues on through here and is going to form uh, the membranous portion of the vestibular system, which I'll talk about in a moment. Scala vestibuli is also going to be continuous here, and it's going to be continuous with all the space surrounding the ducts of the vestibular system, Okay, which we can call the vestibular ducts, if you like. Now, an important point that I want to talk about now is how the fluid inside the cochlear duct is completely different from the fluid inside the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, and I think this should help to sort of nail in the concept into your head. So the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, we've talked about how these two compartments are continuous with one another, so whatever fluid is in them is going to be the same. This fluid is also going to surround the ducts that are part of the vestibular system, and this is known as the perilymph. So all of the fluid in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, and I suppose I should actually state that as a fact, the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli, and in fact all of these compartments are just going to be filled with fluid. Okay, the fluid in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani is known as perilymph, and this is sort of like a normal extracellular fluid. And what do I mean by a normal extracellular fluid? Well, I mean it has a very high sodium concentration, and it has a low potassium concentration, which is the normal ratio for an extracellular fluid. Normally, the fluid outside of cells has a high sodium concentration and a low potassium concentration. And in converse, the concentration of potassium inside cells is very high, and the concentration of sodium is very low. So the perilymph is a sort of normalish um, extracellular fluid, and that's what is going to sur well is going to be in all of these spaces surrounding the important cochlear duct. So in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, you have this perilymph, which is just surrounding the important cochlear duct. Equivalently, up in the vestibular system, the vestibular ducts are going to be surrounded by perilymph that is going to be continuous with the perilymph in the scala vestibuli. So the scala vestibuli space is continuous with this outer portion that's underneath the bone uh, of the vestibular system. So the way it kind of works is that you have the bony labyrinth, then you have a layer of perilymph, and then you have the important ducts of the vestibular system, and almost equivalently for the cochlear system as well. We have the bone, the perilymph, and then the important duct in the middle. Of course, if you went in from the side, you'd get into the, you know, if you went in from here, you'd have bone, and then you'd get into the important duct straight away. But as a kind of basic principle, this is the important thing. This is the cochlear duct, and then it's just bathed in the perilymph surrounding it in these two compartments, the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, and it's equivalent up in the vestibular system. The vestibular ducts are bathed in perilymph. Now, the cochlear duct and the vestibular duct, these contain a very different type of fluid known as the endolymph. And what's weird here is that potassium concentration is actually really high. Now that's very, very unusual for an extracellular fluid. So endolymph has a very, very high potassium concentration. It will still have a large amount of sodium in it, but it also has 
a very large amount of potassium in it and that's what makes it special and this is going to be really important for the function of the cochlear duct and indeed the vestibular duct. Now we're not going to talk about the vestibular duct apart from just going over the anatomy in a moment um, but in another video where I'll discuss the vestibular system we'll see how uh, the composition of the endolymph for very high potassium is necessary for its function. But in this video we will absolutely see how the composition of endolymph for the very high potassium is necessary for the transduction of auditory stimuli. Okay, the other important thing to talk about is something known as the endolymphatic potential. Okay, this refers to the fact that there is an electrical potential difference between the electrical potential in the perilymph and the electrical potential in the endolymph. So, just to remind you, electrical potential is this model from physics. It is a mathematical model to help us understand the reality that we live in, and the idea is this that you ascribe to every point in three-dimensional space a number, a real number. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be zero. Okay, it can be a fraction, it can be a whole number, it can be an irrational number if you want. It can be a transcendental number if you want. It cannot be an imaginary number. You have to stay in the real number system. Okay, so everywhere in three-dimensional space is given this number, this real number, and this real number is called the electrical potential and this electrical potential helps us to understand how charged particles move around the world okay so all points in space have an electrical potential now all of the fluid in the perilymph compartments and all of the fluid in the endolymph compartments it's all continuous with one another it, Therefore, the electrical potential will equilibrate. So the electrical potential in all the points of the perilymph will be the same, and the electrical potential in all the points of the endolymph will be the same. Now, the perilymph compartments and the endolymph compartments aren't continuous with one another. Therefore, it could be possible for there to be a difference in the electrical potential of the two points, i.e. the electrical potential of the perilymph might not be the same as the electrical potential of the endolymph. And indeed, that is the case. And this is referred to as the endolymphatic potential. So what actually occurs is that the electrical potential of the endolymph is actually 80 millivolts higher than the electrical potential of the perilymph. So there is an electrical potential difference of plus 80 millivolts across, for instance, the basilar membrane or Reisner's membrane. So if I move, if I was a little man in, let's say, the Scala Timpani here with a machine for measuring electrical potential, so I might actually even draw this little man here, so here he is, he's got a machine for measuring electrical potential. He would get some number, which would be the electrical potential of the Scala Timpani. He could then, sorry, yes, the Scala Timpani. He could then move into the Scala Media here, and the number on his fancy machine here would change, and that number would go up by 80 millivolts. That is what we mean by the endolymphatic potential. The electrical potential is much higher in the endolymph than in the perilymph. And that's a big electrical potential difference. And it's because of the fact that you've got all these additional positively charged ions there. And the distribution of charged particles determines what the electrical potential at any point is. It's a beautiful model, electrodynamics. The distribution of charged particles determines the electrical potential at every point in space. And the electrical potentials at every point in space determine how the uh, charged particles move. It's, it's very beautiful, the symmetry. Okay, right. So, what I now want to do is continue on with my discussion of the ducts of the vestibular system, and this won't take much longer. We will abandon the vestibular system soon and go back to the auditory system. But just so that the anatomy is absolutely clear, I want to talk about the ducts of the vestibular system. So, I'm drawing the vestibule now, again, from the front here. Okay, so here's the vestibule, and then, of course, you'd have... Um, the basal spiral canal here. And then on top of the vestibule you'll then have the semicircular canals and this is I think is my biggest picture yet so this might again help to communicate this to you. So here is the lateral semicircular canal in that plane between the sagittal and transverse plane. Here is the anterior semicircular canal 
like so, in a sagittal plane, so this is going backwards, and then coming off it, we then have the posterior semicircular canal, like so, in a coronal plane, and here's its ample that attaching in, like so, and you can see this joining of the anterior and posterior semicircular canals, like so. So that I think is my best picture yet of the uh, semicircular canals. But what we're now wanting to see is the ducts. We want to see the connection between the cochlear duct and the ducts of the vestibular system first. So that will come up like so, and it will go into a little sort of um, swelling of endolymphatic fluid, so a little membrane-bound um, bean almost. So it's bound by a membrane and it's floating inside the perilymph, inside the vestibule. So out at the outside we have the bony vestibule. In from that we have the perilymph, which is continuous with the perilymph and the scala vestibuli. And inside this we have suspended a membrane-bound meshwork or network of structures. So here we have the connection between the cochlear duct and the first membrane-bound structure, which is this bag of endolymph, effectively, with a membrane around it. And this is known as the saccule. Okay, so this is the saccule. And the connection between the cochlear duct and the saccule, this has a special name. This is known as ductus reunions. And if you really want to be fancy, you can call it ductus reunions of Henson. Okay, so I'll colour that in. So we'll have the ductus reunions coloured in here in pink, there we go, and then we'll have the saccule coloured in in blue, and then the saccule is going to connect to the next compartment containing endolymph, the next compartment of the vestibular ducts, and this is known as the utricle, so here is the utricle, and this will be connected like so. So this one is the utricle, and the utricle is then going to have the uh, semicircular ducts coming off it. So I'll colour in the utricle in in red. Okay, now let me colour on the semicircular duct. So here we'll have the anterior semicircular duct, which will be a membrane-bound structure inside of the anterior semicircular canal, and surrounding it will still be a layer of perilymph in between the bone and the membrane inside. Okay, so it'll come like so, and here is the posterior semicircular duct in pink here, like so, and then here is the lateral semicircular duct, again in pink, like so. Okay, so those are the ducts of the vestibular system, and again, I want to emphasize this concept that you have the bone on the outside, then inside of that you have a layer of perilymph, and then inside of that you have the actual membranous ducts that we're talking about. So these in pink, these are the semicircular ducts inside of the semicircular canals, which are the names for the bony portions. Then you have the utricle and the saccule. The semicircular ducts are connected to the utricle. The utricle is inside of the bony vestibule, surrounded by perilymph again. It's attached to the saccule, uh, again, which is a membrane-bound sac of endolymph, surrounded by perilymph, and it's got a connection to the uh, cochlear duct via the ductus reunions of Henson. And I'll remind you of this picture here. All of the perilymph of the vestibular system is continuous with the perilymph in the scala vestibuli here, which is why that compartment's called the scala vestibuli, but it's not continuous with the perilymph in the scala tympani, because as you can see, the scala tympani ends here. Okay, it has a blunt ending. So if I was a little man walking in the scala tympani and going towards the basal turn, like so, I would eventually hit a solid dead end where I couldn't go anywhere else. I would have to turn back, go to the helicotrema, and then come up the scala vestibuli here, and then I could get into this compartment containing perilymph surrounding the vestibular ducts. Okay, right. So that's the anatomy of the membranes inside of the labyrinth. We are now going to abandon the vestibular system and we are going to focus wholeheartedly on the cochlear portion of the labyrinth, which is the portion that's going to be involved in hearing. And the first thing that we'll do in the next video is have a look in more detail at this cochlear duct. Specifically, what we want to have a look at is the organ of corti and the um, tectorial membrane. 
Then what we'll be able to look at is the ossicular chain and we'll start to put everything together as to how we're actually going to get transduction of auditory stimuli into electrical signals.